Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Welcome to this very special edition of um, the advanced course on diagnostics uh, when we're going to have a special uh, seminar on the critical role of diagnostics in the management of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and with four regional perspectives. My name is Rosanna Peeling. I'm a professor of diagnostics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and also the director of the International Diagnostics Center. The specific objectives of the uh, webinar today is to provide an overview of the COVID-19 pandemic in four regions of the world, in Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, and they will show us how the pandemic has been managed regarding the access to diagnostics and patient care, some success stories, maybe some failures, and then, uh, importantly, uh, some future uh, perspectives. I will be your moderator for today. For each region, we have one speaker providing the regional perspective and one sp uh, specific country uh, uh, perspective. Each lecture will be 10 minutes long. Participants can ask questions throughout the uh, webinar using the Q&A uh, box. We will have 10 minutes for questions at the end of uh, each the presentations from each region. Before we begin, I would like to give a big thank you to Sandra Angeli, Benedict ben Poncier, and uh, Chloe uh, Massetti from the foundation for de uh, developing uh, the webinar and organizing uh, much of it. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and also uh, Sandra and Chloe will be uh, monitoring the, the questions and comments. Our technical expert today is Mr. Abdul from the Art uh, Cast Company. Um, and if you have any uh, uh, technical difficulties, uh, please send a, a message in the chat box and, uh, and he will try to help you resolve it. This webinar will be recorded and we have uh, the speakers have kindly given us permission to share their slides. So the, the recorded webinar would be available on the foundation website, as well as on uh, the International Diagnostic Center website and, and other websites of our partner um, institutions. So without further ado, I would like to um, start with the first presentation. This first presentation will be given by Dr. John McAngason, the director of the African City. All of us uh, who's been involved in ACDX uh, over the years have always been really uh, happy to have John as our faculty for, uh, since the inception. Um, John was first appointed uh, director of the Africa CDC in November of 2016 to provide strategic direction and position it as an African-owned institution supporting countries to improve surveillance, epidemic preparedness and response, and the prevention of disease spreads. He's a leading virologist with nearly 30 years of work experience in public health. Prior to his appointment um, with the Africa CDC, he was the Associate Director of Laboratory Science and chief of the international laboratory branch at the Division of Global HIV AIDS uh, Center for Global Health at the US uh, CDC. And John is gonna give us uh, an overview of what is the pandemic response like in Africa. Thank you. Over to you, John. Uh, thank, thank you, Rosanna. And uh, a very uh, good afternoon from Addis Ababa, and specifically from the Africa CDC and the headquarters of the African Union Commission. I will, can you show my slide? In the next <clears throat> couple of minutes allocated to me, I will um, uh, bring you to speed with respect to COVID-19 in Africa.
Yeah, can you see my slides, uh, Rosanna? Yes, I can see. Okay, good. Um, I, I will do that in three, uh, in three different aspects. One is the epidemiological update of COVID-19 in Africa very briefly, and then uh, speak to the Africa CDC's response to the pandemic so far, and conclude with some leadership strategies and, and challenges. But first of all, let me thank the organizers for uh, this very uh, kind invitation. Uh, the, the diagnostic uh, 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 work, the ACDX, has been uh, my passion over the last uh, couple of years, many years, in, including my previous career. And I was hoping that, Rosanna, you do something extraordinary to bring us back to um, NSC so that we can have uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, a discussion. So I'm disappointed that you couldn't do that. But anyway, I fully understand the, the challenges and hopefully next year we will be at uh, um, Le Pensier to have this uh, very important dialogue. So first of all, on the epidemiological front, uh, this is where we are as a continent. Uh, it took us uh, 133 days to get to 500,000 uh, infections on the continent of 55 uh, member states, but then only 36 days to get to 1 million infected people on the continent, just showing the speed how uh, initially we thought and the world thought that uh, Africa was having it, uh, uh, it has been spared with this pandemic. But then uh, we always said it was a delayed pandemic, and I think we were right. By July, we saw how quickly uh, the, the virus has spread across uh, the continent. And this slide shows you uh, where we are as of today, September 14, with 1.3 million uh, cases of infections. Um, of those, 80% have recovered, representing 1 million and 32,000 deaths with a case fatality uh, ratio of 2.4%. Uh, on your right-hand side is uh, a curve that uh, tries to aggregate all five geographic regions of the continent. Uh, the different colors there represent uh, the different uh, uh, geographic regions and the, the legends are on the bottom of the, the slide. And the red line indicates a seven days uh, moving average and you can see clearly that uh, two things, uh, take home messages on this slide, that the Southern African region, fueled essentially by South Africa, is driving most of the, the pandemic in, in Africa. And if you look at the curve, the, the moving, the seven days moving average, it shows that uh, we are beginning to see some decreases on, uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, across the continent. But this is so much driven by what is going on in South Africa because South Africa is doing a very good job at uh, bringing down their, bending their curve, as I, I would say. If you now look at the countries, um, uh, individual countries, and you can categorize those into four different pockets. 29 countries are reporting less than 5,000 cases of COVID-19. Nine countries are reporting between 5,000 to 10,000 cases. 12 countries between 10,000 and 50,000 cases. The point of this slide is that as a continent, we still have a very strong chance of pushing back the, this pandemic if we do the right things and do them aggressively and speedily. That is scale up testing, which is the, the subject of this um, course. Uh, followed through with uh, uh, t contact tracing and isolation and uh, in, uh, support that by mass, uh, universal mask wearing and basic hygiene. If you now look at the different regions of the, the continent, uh, it presents a, a, a fascinating uh, picture. Uh, Central Africa on your far left shows that over the last couple of weeks, uh, 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 last four weeks, we have seen uh, a slight increase of uh, 2%. I mean, initially, previously, uh, we are seeing a, really, a very good decline in Central Africa, but the last couple of weeks, we are seeing a 2% a increase. And then uh, uh, North Africa, the green uh, arrow on your far right-hand corner represents North Africa with an increase of 9%. But three regions are showing a steady uh, a, a decrease over the last couple of weeks. And, uh, since uh, the week of the last four weeks to now, uh, that include East Africa with less than a decrease of 7%, uh, 
Southern Africa with 17%, largely influenced by South Africa and West Africa, West Africa 15%. If we now look at the testing supporting this, well, we started off very timidly as a continent. And if you recall, our first cases of COVID-19 were reported on February uh, 14 in Egypt. And then towards the end of February, Nigeria reported and many other countries in March started reporting cases. And but you can see on this slide that diagnostics was very limited on the continent if you look at the green line. Because of that, we, we launched and rolled out a, an initiative called the Partnership to Accelerate COVID Testing in June. And uh, we've since uh, rolled out or supported the continent to really uh, scale up diagnostics. And if you look at this, around that period in May uh, or April, it, the situation was very pathetic. And I actually wrote a personal uh, commentary in Nature, which was a call to action which was our, uh, entitled Letting Africa into the market for COVID-19 diagnostics. And that was followed by the initiative we launched to increase that. And as of today, uh, September 14, the continent has conducted uh, 30 million tests, uh, representing a case, uh, a test per case ratio of uh, 9.7 and a positivity rate of 10%. And uh, we, that represents, the 13 million represents about 1% of the population of Africa, which is 1.3 billion. So we still have a long way to go as a continent uh, that we are making steady progress in that uh, very critical area of, of diagnostics. And if you look at the, um, the continent and you begin to uh, split it into uh, the, COVID, the number of COVID testing per million of population, it gives you a totally different picture. Uh, it shows that 23 countries are conducting less than 5,000 tests per million. 13 countries are conducting 5 to 10 million tests per million. 11 countries between 10,000 to 50,000, and five countries between 50 to 100,000, and two countries above 100,000 per million. Which means that there are some countries that are overperforming, others are underperforming. So the overall a test per case ratio that you see there may be skewed towards uh, because of countries that are doing a lot of testing. The point here is that we still need to do a lot of work to increase the level of testing across the continent. Now, let me just speak to what Africa CDC's response has been. Uh, first of all, in February, we, um, when COVID just hit the continent, we convened uh, an emergency meeting of all ministers of health uh, to develop a joint continental strategy that had two objectives. One was to coordinate our efforts uh, across the, uh, the, the continent and with WHO in order to ensure that we have synergies and minimize duplication, and also to be sure that we use a common proven uh, and promote evidence-based public health practices for our fight against COVID-19. And this slide just summarizes for you that uh, the three pillars or goals of the, the strategy, which was to limit transmission, uh, prevent deaths, and prevent social and economic harm. The harm here was also meant to include the harm that uh, COVID-19 was going to have on uh, the endemic diseases, that is the HIV, TB, and malaria, and immunization programs, of course. And this is a, a, a summary of what uh, the technical working groups that make up this uh, join are driving this uh, strategy. As we speak now, the African Task Force for COVID-19 uh, uh, called AFCOD is in session and they do, we meet every uh, Tuesday at 4 p.m. East African time to uh, look at issues regarding coordination, cooperation, collaboration, and communication. And as we speak today, I believe Chad is in the other room presenting their uh, common experiences and receiving feedback across the continent. And this is an initiative I mentioned earlier, the PAC initiative, which was meant to, uh, we set ourselves a target of conducting 10 million tests. Remember the time we launched PAC in uh, April or June timeline, less than 300,000 uh, uh, COVID tests have been conducted in the continent. And we have since surpassed that target. And now we've set up a new target uh, to achieve uh, uh, 20 million tests in an, uh, by end of October. And we had also established ourselves a goal to create a common platform that will be used continent-wide to uh, support uh, procurement of uh, commodities there. And I will speak to that in, on this slide. 
It is called the African Medical Supply Platform. It is a single online marketplace to enable the supply of COVID-related clinical medical equipment. And it is one of those initiatives that is um, a clear demonstration of the partnership between the private sector led by uh, Strive Masiwa, especially AU Envoy, and the partnership with the uh, African Export Import Bank, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and the Africa CDC. I encourage you to uh, just Google AMSP dot Africa to see more details on what this platform can do. It's amazing. It's like Alibaba.com or uh, the Amazon.com uh, for the continent. And this slide shows you the deployments that we've made. We've deployed over 200 uh, uh, rapid responders in 22 countries, uh, close to 10,000 uh, community workers in 21 countries to support contact tracing efforts in the countries that are indicated. Uh, this is a summary of some of the trainings that we've done across various technical working groups. I'll let you to read this uh, for yourself, but over, um, over 1,000 laboratory experts have been uh, trained. And these are uh, some examples of the trainings that we've done in the area of infection prevention control. Uh, these are uh, pictures that we're taking in Nigeria where we have trained 45, uh, 20, uh, 45 participants from 22 countries and those countries are uh, uh, colored blue in the map. We also have distributed a large number of infection prevention control uh, uh, materials for uh, across the continent and the numbers are all uh, indicated on this slide including 9 million face masks across the continent. Uh, this slide shows you uh, the surveillance work we did uh, very early on in preparing the continent uh, in 18 countries and uh, including airlines and airports were all brought together in Kenya and uh, that is uh, one of us, uh, one of our senior person, Justin, uh, conducting this training in Kenya. And this slide is fascinating and speaks to this group. And it shows you where the continent was uh, in January with no diagnostics capability. And then in February, uh, we had a workshop in Senegal where um, uh, Amadou uh, hosted that workshop. And the picture below here actually shows some of the participants that were there. And uh, Rosanna facilitated that workshop. I remember it was organized, Rosanna, if you recall, within a one week notice um, to bring people to, uh, to Senegal and train them. And that was extremely important uh, workshop because uh, most of the labs that started testing for COVID were those that were trained in Senegal. Then subsequently we did a similar workshop in South Africa and then back in Senegal. That's how we managed to ramp up testing uh, to all countries in, in Africa uh, within or, uh, a very short period of time. And this uh, shows you the evolution of that. And we've now, uh, Af as Africa CDC supplied uh, more than 5 million tests uh, and contributed, as I indicated earlier, to the training of over 1,000 uh, lab experts across the continent. And uh, we're also moving forward with sequencing. We have uh, the countries that are indicated in blue are those that we are supporting them with uh, uh, sequencing capabilities as part of the network of uh, genomic uh, institutes across uh, centers of excellence across the continent as uh, uh, that feed into a public health genomic institute um, that, that uh, uh, operates from Africa CDC. And the lastly, let me just conclude on some of the leadership things we are doing. Uh, this is a, a picture of the, uh, the, the, of the convening of the ministers of health across the continent on February 22nd. It shows what Africa CDC can do. And we do, did that jointly with WHO, Dr. Moeti, you can see her in the middle there. Dr. Tedros also called in and we developed the strategic plan that I mentioned. As we speak as a continent, uh, we are easing the lockdown, and um, I, co I invite you to read the second part of this slide, which talks about screening measures. And from uh, right to left, 29 countries are requesting that you have a negative PCR test before you travel. Uh, then nine countries are requesting a mandatory testing at the, at the borders, and 14 others are requesting that you quarantine people for 14 days. I think that is... Uh, uh, going to be uh, a, a need to harmonize our practices on the continent. So we have since launched uh, to address that, launched a, a campaign called Africa Against COVID-19, underpinned by the need to save lives, economies, and livelihood using the whole of society approach. And uh, it has three uh, goals, to protect borders and travel, 
protect economies and livelihood and protect schools. And uh, just to uh, show you the goals, you can read the details later, is to minimize the spread of infection within and across borders by creating public health safe corridors. We need uh, trusted testing. Uh, we need uh, that, that information is shared across the board in a verifiable manner and also a mechanism of sharing the data across the uh, entire continent. And to support the economic uh, goal, we need to minimize the impact of COVID on economies and livelihood by developing digital frameworks that would track and share critical information to support uh, the, the creation of the safe public health corridors, supporting mutual recognition of health information, and then strengthening our risk communication. I'll conclude here by on this slide that as we, uh, the pandemic gets into a different phase in Africa, we need to build more partnership to expand the PAC initiative, which is partnership to accelerate COVID testing. We need to increase our border testing and enhance surveillance, and more importantly, engage our communities so that they can own the response and lead it and reinforce public health measures, such as public health, uh, use, of, uh, uh, use of masks in, in, in public places, physical distancing and proper hand washing, but very importantly, begin a discussion on what do we really do to build a resilient health system using COVID as the driver so that we can better prepare for the future and actually uh, begin local production of diagnostics on the continent of Africa. I'm very pleased that just yesterday, Ethiopia announced that they will be producing uh, 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 at least 15 million uh, uh, test, uh, 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 PCR-based tests uh, to support Ethiopia's effort on the continent. And the factory was, I think, inaugurated just uh, uh, two days ago by the Prime Minister. That is a very welcome initiative. We also know that Amadou Sars Group is developing diagnostics. We know that our friends in uh, uh, Christian Happy's lab in Nigeria is developing diagnostics. And we also uh, groups in uh, Morocco, South Africa, and Kenya. We didn't see that before. So I think there's a silver lining in COVID that we may actually be uh, uh, hitting the ground and running and finally implementing the Africa's um, a collaborative to advance diagnostics called AFCAD, which we developed uh, last year. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Back to you, Rosanna. Thank you so much, uh, John. That's a, a great talk. and, and uh, um, it's been great to have you uh, at the leadership uh, of uh, Africa CDC. I can't imagine what this pandemic would look like uh, without Africa CDC. So uh, without further ado, um, let's uh, go to uh, the second talk for this region before we open up uh, the presentations for questions. The second talk will be given by Dr. Amadou Sal, uh, the director of the Institut Pasteur Dakar in Senegal. Uh, Dr. Sal is uh, currently the, the head of the uh, arbovirus and viral hemorrhagic fever unit and director of the WHO Collaborating Center and the scientific director of the Institut Pasteur Dakar which is part of the um, uh, international network of the Institute Pasteur. Uh, Dr. Sal's uh, research focuses primarily on diagnostics, ecology, and evolution of arboviruses and viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, Dr. Sal has published more than 100 uh, papers and book chapters and has given, I know, many, many scientific uh, talks at international meetings. He's uh, uh, on several WHO uh, expert groups, including the Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network and the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization. And he's also worked as a consultant for the World uh, Organization for Animal Health. And so today, um, Dr. Sal would give a, a talk on the uh, update on COVID-19 activities in Senegal with a special uh, reference to diagnostics. Amadou, over to you. Thanks very much, Rosanna. Sorry, I've, I've been struggling with the, the techniques. Um, I don't know whether you can see my slides. Rosanna, do you see my slides? Yes. Slides, yes. yes. Okay, very good. So I've been asked within the next 10 minutes to try to give uh, the experience of Senegal and John has covered quite well as usual. 
uh, through an amazing talks, uh, the situation we have in Africa. So I'm just gonna uh, try to see what it looks like at a country level and just give a few hints about that. So uh, just to start with, to give us some background about the situation in Senegal, where we have the epidemic curve that is represented here and uh, which reflect a situation that started very slowly, went to uh, increase around May and uh, just move uh, as a plateau for some weeks and start over the last four months, four weeks, sorry, to, to decrease uh, as, as was explained earlier for the West Africa situations. And you could see here in the reds uh, that there have been some deaths all around that really started with between week uh, 24 to week 27 with an increase that we managed to be stable, but we sent it up also decrease. Out of that, we end up with 14, a little bit more than 14,000 confirmed cases, among which most of it recovered, but 297 deaths. And uh, uh, in past year, we tested a little bit more, 150,000 tests uh, with a positivity rate of uh, uh, 5.0. And in this slide, I was just trying to explain what has been the dynamic of the epidemic of the time, which is uh, reflected by the earlier um, uh, epidemic curves, which show that it really started ramping up where we have a, a huge augmentation on the basic predictive number where we have quite a lot of infection. But over time, we have some peaks around 50 days, which show the increase part, and then went to some sort of plateau and stable. And recently you can see that this basic reproductive number is from time to time a little bit below one, a little bit up above one, which show that we are going to a situation that is being decreasing and for which actually we are quite happy with being vigilant. And this is also reflected on the transmission chain that we are following. And as an illustration, and you can see from uh, March up to now that more than 90, 926 uh, uh, chains of transmission have been followed and out of that only 7% are still very active even though we went through a situation where you could see that the virus has been circulating and some chain has very tough time being stopped because I mean we have two chains that went through six out of the 14 region of Senegal and then most of them actually are, 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 are stopped. Um, if you look at the, the, the situation about the confirmed case, one can see that uh, mostly the age group that are being affected are the one between 20 to 50 years. But when you look at the deaths, it's more at the age as a risk factor, and particularly men has been particularly hit by this, uh, this epidemic. Now, if you look at the virus itself, what we have seen and done in cooperation with this initiative, uh, with Africa CDC, um, and the different labs in, in Africa, uh, where we, through the sequencing, we can see really what has been at some point important has been the introduction of the virus, because just analyzing the first 100 samples, we could see that 37 introduction happened, mostly from Europe, but it moved also, it come from other parts of uh, uh, the world, including Africa. And this has been expanded uh, over time, and it would be interesting to understand that. The reason why I'm bringing this is that Understanding that and following rightly the, 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 the transmission chain is key actually and where diagnostic is absolutely capital because the early detection would allow that. Now I'm just coming to like the, the, the next slide to discuss quickly the testing and what, have we, what we have done in Senegal in this regards and uh, which has been uh, some kind of example of what happened in many African countries with some local innovation and some uh, local uh, capacity that has been developed. This has been mainly based on four main topics. One was uh, about uh, reorganizing and doing innovation more in the way that we get ourselves organized. But also for that specific point, I just want to discuss some special distribution hub that we've worked out with Africa CDC uh, that Jen touched a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the digital platform, the decentralization and the manufacturing of RDT as a way to scale up the testing. Uh, so decentralization actually happened progressively, but I'm just showing in this map that in Senegal, the idea has been as the epidemic was deploying and unfolding, we have opened different labs in different parts of the region. We started with two labs in south part of the Senegal, but now we have in 10 different regions labs that are operating. And the reason why this is important is uh, it allowed to have a central lab in the capital, have peripheral lab, 
and have a capacity with a mobile lab to deploy, if need be, some itinerant mobile lab as a search capacity where it needs it. It was very important at the very beginning. And also an opportunity to, to train as a lab to make the system more sustainable. And I'm just giving you an example of the National Public Health Laboratory through these networks. And this is, has to do a lot with the mobility that symbolized by the, 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 the the mobile lab, uh, also the testing inside, but connectivity that play an important role. The reason why also this decentralization is important is that the Senegal has a strategy to open treatment center throughout the countries. And we started with one in Dakar and end up with 37 different treatment center open. And each of those treatment center, we had to find a way to connect them with a lab that would give some early detection. And that's why this decentralization has been an opportunity for training, an opportunity uh, to help capacity growing in terms of reaction. And that was extremely helpful to control some of the chain transmission I was mentioning earlier. Um, the connectivity has played a key role. And the reason why I'm bringing this is that uh, if you want to be everywhere at the same time without actually degrading the, the, um, the quality of the work and making sure the prestation is good, we had actually to reinvent the whole system uh, to be able actually to connect the sample test that you can see on top of the slides and uh, make sure that through some server that we design and some collector system to make it mobile platform, you could interface the patient, the travelers with our system where they are on the Senegalese territory. And at the same time, give the lab the opportunity to validate every single result, not only on site where, which is a central lab, but also be in a position to do that for all the different lab in the countries and through this connection. And also this connection would help also to get all the epidemiological information for the lab, not only to interpret the results, but also for other team like data scientists to be able to connect and follow as many as possible of this transmission chain, which is key to stop the epidemic. So this is working also for travelers as shown in the low um, of, this, uh, of, of this, this slide, but also in each of the area, we can do that with surveillance sites, but also with every head of district can get access to the result depending where the lab is, and they can have the result almost, uh, I mean, the same day, which has been a very important uh, criteria uh, by which actually the, the response could be done properly. Now, a second aspect I wanted to touch besides uh, the decentralization and uh, uh, the mobile platform was just this manufacturing of tests. Jan was mentioning earlier this manufacturing of rapid tests, which is a project uh, uh, that is called Jetropics. And I'm taking this opportunity to thanks once again, Rosanna, who has been sort of the one that came with these ideas on five or six years ago that we should do RDTs. And this is now a reality with this building you see on top left. And the whole idea about this is about promoting access. And I'm very grateful to all the partners that are supporting this, whether it's Foundation Milieu, Find, and IRD that support it financially or in terms of expertise. And obviously, Mologic, on re with, uh, which we have been really actually focusing on these uh, rapid test and with which we have been developing these IgM, IgG, IgA antibody tests and uh, for which we are working actually on this antigen with the support of DEFID, Welcome, Islamic Development Bank, KFW. Uh, the system works uh, to make it uh, actually really available is first to produce it locally. John has mm -hmm. talked about it is important. But second, to make it demand driven, because this may allow us not to produce things that we don't really need. But when somebody needed from African Union, West African Health Organization, NGOs, which are our partners, you can quickly move to some sort of approach business model where you have some uh, two arms, one which is more like a membership fees, uh, which is done on a yearly basis. And through that membership uh, fees, you can support and mutualize actually what most of the functioning part of this uh, platform. And uh, through some manufacturing phase, which is mostly based on cost of goods, which allow actually for the people belonging to that group, just to get the test at the cost of goods, which can go $1, a little bit higher or a little bit less, depending on which, uh, which uh, test we're talking about. But all these models work with the fact that you may end up just charging 
uh, only one, one third of the price of it, which, which is critically important. As we know in Africa, that the price is a key driver for that. Uh, so where are we with that specific topics? Uh, I mean, today this, uh, this building has been working since March 2020, 200 square meters. There have been first training batch with NS1 uh, uh, April, and I want to thank Chef Tidian Jan, who is heading all this group. And now uh, we went through a first a successful uh, audit stage uh, for the certification by BSI. And then now we are confirming the search two assessment that's gonna happen in October that will allow us to be fully actually uh, certified to be able actually to get these reconnections. And between now and then we have uh, since uh, June where we have these first test and preliminary results uh, increase the capacity for the manufacturing with 27 people hired and you can see them in these pictures um, which is on one of the stairs which looks like the double helix uh, uh, where you have all these people uh, gathering to show that this increase in capacity and since the beginning we have been uh, able and share team has been able actually to build 22 small uh, researches on the COVID batches since June, and right now there is work with Mologic uh, on some dipstick version of this to be able to increase capacities. Um, just a few ideas about what has been done in terms of evaluation. I mean, IPT Dakar is one of the evaluation lab for uh, Africa CDC, but this has been done with the ELISA that show um, some reasonably good uh, uh, capacity with a sensitivity that can be more than 90% uh, when we talk about a 21 day, which is a, an ELISA developed by Mologic who is a consortium funded by Welcome and Diffit. And uh, that's allowed today to have this to run some uh, survey at national level. Uh, also the rapid test that I was mentioning, uh, we just summarize here the data that show that in terms of sensitivity for IVG, it's uh, uh, 65.3% uh, and 99 for specificity. But when it comes to IGM, which is the most important part that we wanted to use because we want this to triage, to do contact tracing, as well as being able actually to do a little bit of uh, several survey, we are like 91% uh, of this that's happening uh, in terms of sensitivity and 947 uh, for specificity. And if you break that down in terms of days of onset, you see that at the very early stage with IGM, you can go 85%, but if you focus really on these uh, five to seven days, it can be more than 90%. So this is just to give you some, some preliminary data uh, about this and the detail when it's being write up as a papers. Now, I wanna just finish with this point about creativity, which is some sort of app that has been built uh, with Africa CDC, because at the very early beginning, we didn't have any capacities because of lockdown to move around different samples. And that's why I think reorganization and innovation is important because Africa CDC came with this idea about making sure that uh, we can get the reagent uh, from Germany. It, uh, and from Germany, using some Korea, we could actually channel some reagent to the different labs in Africa. And by this way, we distribute more than 2 million of uh, some of, of, of testing, whether it's PCR, gene experts, uh, through gene expert format or in different form. I'm just going to stop here because I know that's 10 minutes and I may have uh, gone a little bit beyond my time. Thanks very much uh, to you, Rosanna, for the invitation and the organizer. Over to you. Thank you very much, Amadou. That's a great talk. And so we had two great talks and we have a number of uh, questions uh, from uh, the Q&A box and the chat box. Um, so I would just, uh, I guess we're a little bit behind time. So I would just like to pose uh, two questions to John and, and two to Amadou. First of all, uh, John, uh, so what are the three biggest challenges with diagnostics for COVID in Africa? And also, um, what is that community action that's needed to drive diagnostic uptake uh, in Africa. John? Yeah, th thank you, Rosanna. I think that there are three uh, different challenges that we uh, face as a continent and to uh, really scale up diagnostics. Uh, first of all is that um, we should 
is access to diagnostics. I think, uh, as I indicated earlier, and uh, Amadu touched on that, uh, all our diagnostics are coming from outside. And I think you don't, you, you don't um, win a war by uh, importing all your, your weapons all the time. I think you have to be able to manufacture some of that. I think the delays, especially in the context of the response that is required, is very important. I think that is um, uh, uh, critical. The second challenge that we have uh, is, um, that, and uh, let me just go back to that and say that we really hope that it will be a new day for the continent to really focus on manufacturing diagnostics uh, for its own security. It is a security issue. The, the gymnastics that we played with um, uh, uh, orchestrated with Amadou, and I mean, it was incredible. I mean, we would have to make uh, uh, one day write a, 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 a book chapter on, on, on that. I mean, where the airspace is locked, but yet you need to support member states with diagnostics. And you can't tell them that, no, you don't know where to find it, diagnostics. You have to, anyway, I remember uh, Amadou was in Goma and we were communicating and we, and Rosanna, I believe you were in Canada, we were saying, let's do a workshop and let's do it towards the end of the week because there were no diagnostics there. And they, we had to wait for the diagnostics to be shipped from Germany to Dakar, they got to the airport, we called, I remember telling them, Mario, I said, look, good news, the diagnostics are in the airport, send somebody to go get it immediately. So Africa cannot defend itself against these diseases by such actions. The second challenge is the type of test. Um, the PCR-based tests are okay, but that is just not the right tool uh, uh, um, in, for us to, to fight this pandemic. It's, uh, it requires that uh, we do point of care testing that can be scaled up. I mean, Africa knows how to test. We test uh, millions of people every year for uh, on PCR or viral load testing in HIV, TB, and other things there. So it's just the right type of test. It was just uh, the PCR that exists today are just not appropriate for that. The last thing is that, I mean, the, the, the scaling up and, and speedily. The pandemic is uh, in the community. And you have to be able to have a test that you, like the rapid test for HIV that you can easily move into the community and do the appropriate things that uh, follow uh, testing, which is the, the contact tracing, isolation and, and others. So I think those are three different things that must be done. The community has to play a critical role in, in that you destigmatize testing. And I mean, and that uh, uh, COVID is a disease that can affect any of us. And, um, and which cannot uh, discriminate or stigmatize. If you, we, the community doesn't own that and, and be proactive in that this is a, not a disease like others, then it, became, it becomes very complex for the, for the testing to be, even be implemented. Thank you, John. I think without communities, I mean, we, we, in an, any pandemic, without communities and people taking action, governments can not get anywhere and, uh, and very fast for, for the pandemic. Thank you. And so for Amadou, um, uh, what is the national strategy for testing in Senegal? And um, your interruption of transmission rates are uh, very impressive. Uh, what do you do by targeting what kind of interventions? Thank you very much, Rosanna, for these two questions. Concerning the national strategy, uh, up to June, it was to test anybody with symptoms. And when we have that personal suspect case, we would take all the different contacts and sample them and test them, which was like a quite large strategy because at some point we were running a lot of tests every day. But we realized actually in June uh, that we want to decentralize to make that available. And I've been seeing that most of the people that we're having was asymptomatic and started um, going beyond the capacities of the hospitalization. Because in Senegal, the uh, confirmed case were hospitalized. The contact while they were being followed was uh, in hotel, which was a kind of strategy to make sure we cut everything out channel of transmission as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's national strategy was then the suspect case and all contacts and everybody's around and get everybody isolated. Since June, we focus on the suspect cases because we realized that we have more civil cases and the idea was to be extremely quick in detecting those cases and making sure we focus on vulnerable people. So whenever we have someone that is confirmed, we actually take all the contact that are beyond 60 years, which is really what shows the data that are people, that, that are elderly people. 
and also be able actually to make sure that we take all people that we call have at risk, meaning that they have diabetes or respiratory problems and things, and all these people are already t are also tested, and we do that at the level of all the territory. Concerning the transmission, uh, the chains of transmission, your questions, I touched it a little bit. The idea was at the very beginning why the things was very contained in the car, there are, there are restrictions on moving around the territory up to like April, May. The idea was whenever we have a case, we sample everybody around, all the positives and the contacts, the positive are hospitalized, the contacts are put in hotels so we break the chains. And that will explain actually the high rate of, of chain being stopped. But recently, as I showed you some of the chain, when we open actually the restriction to move between region, some of the chain of transmission went far away and we have three chain that are moving like more than seven generation, which is uh, quite long, but finally many of them has been, has been stopped. And right now we're focusing on early detection and as soon as we get them through the process I described earlier, we can stop them. Over to you, Rosanna. Thank you very much. Um, and so now um, we will move on to Latin America as a region. And our first speaker is Carlos Govier. Uh, Carlos, um, and like, and like many people I know, um, comes from so many different backgrounds and can do so many things. It's, he's pretty amazing. He graduated in uh, public uh, administration and law and holds an MBA, has many university appointments, and uh, um, uh, after he uh, practiced in the legal area, actually um, became CEO of different businesses and business manager at Organon Technica, one of the well-known diagnostic companies. And then also, um, he's also the managing director for a company dedicated to nutrition in Latin America. Now, he's currently in charge of um, several associations, uh, including executive director at the Ethics uh, Health Institute, uh, executive president of the Chamber of Commerce in, in Brazil, and also director of the uh, Brazilian Alliance for Innovative Healthcare Industry and uh, Special Purpose Food Industry. And he's, uh, importantly to us, he's the founder of the Latin America um, Alliance for the Development of Infidual Diagnostics. Um, that um, actually happened at ACDX. Over to you, Carlos. Thanks a lot, Rosanna. It's with great pleasure that I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of COVID in Latin America. And nothing better to show that Aladiv is only active thanks to the very big network uh, with many organizations, not only in Brazil, in the region, but also globally. Uh, it indeed started some years ago, almost yesterday, Rosanna, it seemed like uh, the other day, but it's over 10 years ago. And uh, it was really a very big venture because it got together people from the whole continent, as you can see. Uh, it has already produced many outputs, uh, many workshops, webinars, and it's indeed a unique entity because it gets together academy, government, and industry all together uh, in order to discuss several issues that we see on the day by day. And issues like innovation, regulation, quality, just to start. And if you see, Everyone remembers Dr. Spock with his scanner. Was that science fiction or is reality? And like this, diagnostic has evolved very fast. Very fast that we cannot even cope with this fast speed. Everyone was used with molecular biology inside the labs, but nowadays we can see a point of care instrument just by the field in very different conditions with high technology applied to it. Not only this very sophisticated instruments, but if we see even rapid tests that can be taken anywhere and they can do a lot of work exactly bringing diagnostic to be as precise as early as possible as a fantastic tool for a correct and proper therapy. So with this whole uh, development of new technologies, IT system integrating the solutions, and putting them available for governments 
and different public policy programs, we can really make a big, a big uh, step ahead. And that's the idea with COVID. COVID was something that nobody was expecting. It was, of course, a big pandemic. It is a big pandemic that came as a surprise, initially in Asia, and soon, and little by little, coming to the other continents. If we see in America, in Latin America, we had different approaches. Uh, each country was actually trying to do the best in different moments. There was nothing immediately coordinated, perhaps like Africa, but little by little countries were trying to see, okay, this is going to reach me sometime, what should I do? And PAHO as an organization, the Pan American Health Organization, actually had a very important role in this. Here you see a little bit of the number of cases in all the different countries. This material is going to be available for you all. But what we can see is that it did struck, struck, struck the, the continent in different ways and in, even in different uh, strength. It, just in the case of Brazil, you can see what is the big impact we had in the North region, for instance. And uh, the same will apply for each and every country. But Bajo, as an organization that has already a very good reputation for many decades with the countries, did have an important role not only in terms of training, courses and webinars, negotiation together with WHO and indeed at UNICEF, you can find a platform for procurement that would guarantee uh, uniform, uniform prices and access to different suppliers, or even sometimes via a strategic fund to support countries in need to do uh, procure and distribute molecular test, that was very important. Not to mention training, like before, the, like in February, everyone without mask here, or the webinars, or even the procurement support, or even the technical guidelines. Many countries had different stages of development in terms of the molecular uh, network. Some were more ahead, some others were actually starting or did not even have the equipment. For that. So that's a very big challenge on how to do. So I would say that from a regional point of view, Bahu tried to do the best effort in order to combine. But it's important to have a proper gap analysis. And if we see, uh, not only we have the surveillance systems to be checked, uh, the response and planning capacity for the, each country, and then like uh, or uh, like Amadou and John said, the logistic issue was very strong and, and a big problem. Uh, test availability was not so easy to do, and then you can at least see what was the outcome. So far, and this is uh, one of the latest reports, you see over 102 guidelines issued, over 6.4 million uh, tests distributed with the support of PAHO. This does include several countries that did the procure on their own uh, and several key information. And you see there was a big plan on different areas. In terms of capacity of lab, so what would be needed? And uh, so I would say that we do have here some very good lessons on how to actually uh, be prepared and respond quicker in the next pandemic because each country still suffered. If you see Argentina had uh, the longest quarantine ever in, in the whole world and still so they are seeing some upgrades or some peaks again of cases. Uh, an economic impact for them is going to be terrible. 12% decrease on their GDP, 12% of people will come out as miserable, 40% of the population will be poor. It's a terrible impact. Bolivia also trying to do their best, but is still seeing some problems. Chile, you can see with decision trees, they were in good conditions, they had a good lab system, but still in some provinces, you see the infection rate increasing again. Paraguay trying to do 
what they could in terms of PCR. They started very well, closed at their borders, but you see peaks again. So in order to cope with this higher demand, they're trying even to introduce now antigen testing in order to replace the PCR that they are not in conditions to do, or at least to uh, go quicker for, for contact tracing. Uh, Brazil, we had the worst scenario, as you all know, over 4.3 million cases uh, confirmed so far. Uh, the number of DCs, over 130,000 people that, and uh, okay, we still see some regions going up, but in most of the country, we see decrease in the, the rate. Uh, the government, the Ministry of Health itself, planned initially to buy over 46 million tests. Uh, 23 of them would be, 23 million would be molecular, the rest rapid test. But at the end, only 6.5 million were uh, actually purchased. However, they had this challenge to do, uh, install a network of labs focused on molecular for uh, COVID. What they had to do is to try to get research labs, everyone that would have molecular uh, instrument, a PCR instrument to actually support. But they also counted with, with the very good expertise of the STD department of the Ministry of Health, focus on HIV, hepatitis, and syphilis, that had expertise, personnel available, even instruments that could be used for COVID. So there was a lot of uh, existing platforms that could be shared for this kind of challenge. In terms of diagnostic, uh, it's being used not only to test, like laboratory diagnostic, molecular, serological, but also antigen, but also a lot in the cases where you don't have tests available, going for clinical or even for imaging sometimes. If you see, at least we're going to get out of this pandemic with a better capacity for molecular. That's, I think, I hope it's going to be a good outcome. In terms of uh, strategy, what we could do, and the civil society actually should play a role in this. And this, I'm going to go very quickly, what we had done. Initially, in terms of access, trend in quality and to work forward in terms of mass testing. We had in February almost no tests available. Uh, China and Korea started to develop their own and soon after we had all the different technologies of uh, IVD available. But the registration wouldn't be a, a very easy process. So what we had to do, we started to discuss with a visa that was very keen on approving a kind of fast track, this uh, RDC 348, that actually allowed us to have today over 385 registered products for diagnostics. Some are the same, of course, by different uh, companies, but at least today we have a wide variety of products that were each time getting better and better. But anyway, these products, were only allowed in the country if they would have GMP, they are risk class three. So to do that, Anvisa used a very important uh, regulatory uh, tool, which is the Reliance. As part of IMDRF, International Medical Device Regulators Forum, used the decisions taken by other regulatory bodies in order to allow. This is a big step. But with many new products, many new suppliers, how we would be sure that the products would be available in good quality and good performance. We got a kind of consortium with the medical societies, clinical analysis, clinical pathology labs, and also 13 labs, all together in a kind of joint venture in order to evaluate all the kits of coronavirus in the market. The website is here, it's in Portuguese, but you can understand. And we were available to engage all these different civil society stakeholders that had scientific knowledge in order to have under the same protocol uh, possibility with 13 public and private labs to evaluate the performance of real life with uh, patients with COVID from 
at the Brazilian patients, what would be the final outcome in terms of performance and quality. So we had over 10,000 samples analyzed so far, over 52 kits available, and this is going to be a very good material uh, for future publications together with London School and also the other organizations. It's a, a unique uh, experience that is actually supporting several others. So if we have access to new products, we can at least monitor quality. What sh should do next? Try to have mass testing, exactly to have a good picture of what is happening. So we were counting already in potential with 6,000 hospitals, 18,000 labs, but drugstores were not allowed. So in visa authorized through this new RDC, the drugstores to test, execute the test, rapid test in their own premises. And this indeed brought a lot. Just for you to have an idea, around 2,000 of this 88,000 pharmacies started to do, but they have found so far, they have performed over 700,000 tests with a prevalence of 14%. This, so this is a very good indication of how we can go as close as possible to where the citizen, the population is using the existing structures of healthcare. Uh, last but not least, companies can do the same if they are supported by a clinical lab. So they could do for their own employees and eventually for their own communities. So in conclusion, I would say that diagnostics, yes, it's part of the solution. We must never forget the right task to be used for the right patient in the right place and at the right time. Right, Rosanna? Combination of tests are the best. So we should use them in the proper situation. We don't have the right solution, so we have to combine our existing resources. So I, I'm sure that diagnostics is, too, is the best tool for a public, correct public health policy. And as a final lesson in this whole pandemic for the future ones, is that we do have to count from the regulatory point of view on reliance and for all the other actions with cooperation among the different stakeholders. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Sorry for breaking my time. Thank you very much, Carlos. And um, so in, um, uh, thank you for a really um, fantastic look at testing across uh, different countries. So now we um, uh, will move to a country specific uh, presentation from uh, Professor uh, Patricia Garcia. Uh, Patty has been a long time faculty at ACDX and she's the only person I know who's been the head of the uh, National Institute uh, Dean of School of Public Health and a Minister of Health. And I think as she will tell you, she's starting yet another career, which is really fantastic. Uh, Patty's been recognized uh, for a long time as a global uh, leader in global health. She's been uh, a member of the PAHO Foundation Technology Advisory Group and uh, a board member of Consortium Universities in Global Health and also affiliate professor at the University of Washington and uh, involved in many areas for um, STDs, HPV and medical uh, informatics. And she has been recently appointed a member of the US National Academy of Medicine, uh, becoming the first Peruvian professional with such a distinction. And now over to you, Patty. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, Will? Yes, yes, thank you. So um, what I would try to do in the next 10 minutes is to um, tell you a little bit of the story of the case of Peru and the rapid serologic tests for COVID-19. So you have heard about Latin America. On February the 26th, Brazil reported the first case of COVID. Um, and by March, um, WHO was declaring the whole thing a pandemia. And by March 19th, every country in Latin America had reported COVID-19 cases. Um, basically, Latin America has been hit very hard. The epidemic initially affected the higher income groups returning from abroad and their close contacts, but rapidly it spread 
to lower income populations that have less access to health services. In Peru um, is a country that is quite diverse. We have a coast that is a desert, we have the Andean region, and we have the jungle. And we have 32 million uh, people that are located all around the country, but we have a big mega city, which is Lima, that has one third of our population. And one thing that has happened in Latin America in general is that uh, because of socioeconomic and con contextual issues, um, it has been difficult for us to really address the problem of, the, of COVID and the political instability in most of the countries has been an issue. So in Peru, for example, we, since 2017, we have been going into a political crisis and instability. We have had during this period, a change of seven ministers of health. I have been the first one during this period. And actually I doubled the average time of ministers of health and I lasted only a year and two months. Um, so there were so many things happening and we have even a new Congress that was started in January 2020 after the president was replaced by, by a vice president and the previous Congress was dissolved. So actually Peru began its pandemic response preparations early because we were aware of the weaknesses of our fragmented and under budgeted health system because we were aware of all these social issues and the political instability. We also had limitations on our molecular testing capabilities in the public sector. Only the National Institute of Health in Lima, which is the capital city, was capable of doing molecular testing. We had this process of regionalization in which every single region now has their own money and none of the regions had invested in the capacities of the public health laboratories. So on February the 2nd, uh, we had our first national plan for preparation and response against COVID. And we even had a guideline for the management of suspected cases. But as you have heard, um, in the whole region, uh, we had problems for purchasing um, supplies because the big nations, Europe, the US, they had already, I mean, they have been using already all the supplies. And actually, we even have more delays buying PPEs, medical equipment, oxygen, and all the supplies for laboratory testing. And that was, we realized that very early. And by March 6, we had the first confirmed case of COVID in Peru. And by March 15th, very early in the pandemic, the president declared in state of national emergency with a lockdown that placed a strict controls on citizen movements, except to purchase food or pick up medicines. So we had remote work introduced and only the workers from critical sectors were allowed to really move around the city and the national borders were closed. And actually it was a very strict, a very, very strict lockdown. Although one of the interesting thing that happens is that people, I mean, Peruvians were not used to follow the rules. And actually at some point during the pandemic or during the, the close down, we have more people at the police stations, the people that were infected because they were not following the rules. So what happened with uh, the diagnostics was interesting. So the Ministry of Health started a hotline and a website for individuals with symptoms so they could be interviewed by health professionals for possible follow-up. And actually we were prioritizing the visits according to the age, the risk factors and the diversity of the symptoms. But the problem is that with the shortage of um, EPPs, protection uh, equipment, and with a shortage of molecular tests and with very limited laboratory capacity, um, there was not much that we could do. I mean, we were interviewing people, but diagnostics could not be made. So because we had this experience with rapid tests for syphilis, that we worked in the country that was very successful, um, we were trying to find out what was available that could help us because molecular testing was not going to be possible. And believe it or not, very early in April, nobody was paying any attention to rapid tests for COVID, okay? And actually we were able to um, contact Korea and China because we knew that they were doing something and we were able to buy very rapidly 1.5 million rapid tests, okay? And that really make a big difference. Okay, we started doing testing, 
with teams that were visiting individuals at home to do the rapid antibody test, okay? And those individuals that were IgM and or IgG positive and were having mild symptoms were quarantined, where people who needed critical care were referred to hospitals. The rapid tests were also used at the hospitals because we were having people with symptoms, but because the molecular tests were delayed, nobody knew if they were COVID or not. So rapid tests were also used at the hospitals as a confirmation for the diagnosis of cases. And anybody who was negative on the antibody test, those were the ones that will have the swab collected for molecular testing. But actually the molecular testing was still very slow. It could take a week to get the results because of all the delays um, that uh, the laboratories were having. So as a result, what happened is that to date, we have been able to test more than 3.5 million people, but more than 80% of those tests are rapid tests, okay? So at this point, uh, we have had already two waves of, of um, infections. We are going down right now, the second wave, but we have about 700,000 positive cases about 500, so half a million people recuperated. Um, and we have most of the cases that we have been able to um, detect have been through rapid tests. So in a way, if you look at the numbers, if we are 32 million and we have 3.5 million uh, people tested, we have been able to test 11% of the population in Peru. However, I would like to talk about the good and the bad in the implementation of the rapid tests. Let's start with the good, okay? Well, one of the things that we were able to do is a rapid validation of the rapid tests before implementation. And actually we found that they were relatively good and, and we couldn't find really, um, a, actually there was a very low rate of, of false negatives, okay? So that made us feel very comfortable with the tests that they, that the government bought initially this 1.5 million and eventually several millions more. There we were able to test a large number of symptomatic individuals and contacts um, in the community, relieving the backlog, reducing the waiting time for molecular tests significantly still. And we were able to test the cases at the hospital for people that have, were having clinical symptoms by the negative PCR. And actually the the, the rapid test became so popular, really, that we started doing even general population surveillance. And uh, we learned that, for example, at the level of the country, um, we have about 25% of the people in different communities are positive at this point. But we have at least one community in which around, and, and that community had a, a terrible problem with the pandemic. Um, with the epidemic, um, they have about 70% of the population already infected. And actually they have almost no cases now. So probably they, they have uh, reached um, at this point, um, most of the people infected. But what is the bad? Well, initially the rapid tests were really satanized and they were satanized because no, everybody wanted molecular tests. And actually there were some um, groups, basically the, these intermediate distributors that wanted to bring molecular tests, but actually nobody was able to bring molecular tests because they were, the borders were closed and there were no supplies, but they didn't want the rapid tests to be introduced in the country. But pretty soon, the rapid tests were prostituted. And I have to say that because everybody wanted a rapid test, okay? People were offering tests at home. And what happened is that there were this situation in which health workers were found stealing supplies and selling it to other people. So they were knocking your doors and offering you the, the rapid test at home. Many brands of rapid tests began to appear in the market and there was no capability of the government to do any type of quality control. Even, I mean, outside in, in a corner, you could find somebody selling you in the black market rapid tests everybody wanted to be tested, irrespective of symptoms, because there was this feeling that the rapid test was a health certificate. 
So if you wanted to do something, you have to show a rapid test that was negative. And actually that was backed, unfortunately, by policies of the government to test workers, um, to even the people that were doing delivering, delivering of food or any type of service had to be tested. Everybody who had to work had to be tested. And the problem is that there, was, there were even rules about testing and retesting. In certain jobs, you have to be retested every week. Um, and, and that created a false idea of security for the people that was negative. Even in, in um, closed spaces, uh, working spaces, if several of them were rapid test negative, they could take their, they felt that they could take their masks out. And, um, and there was no communication campaign to, from the government to go against this type of behaviors. So the tests were used also to test everywhere, at bus stops, at markets, and all of the data was mixed. So confirmed cases and all this other testing that was really surveillance was all mixed because we have this definition of a confirmed case in Peru that was any that is still anybody with either a molecular or a rapid test. And the other problem was that there was no understanding of the meaning of the results. What was an IgG versus an IgM or both, or what meant to have a repeat test. So you were positive and they repeat the test in a month and you were still positive, so you need to be in quarantine again and again and again. And it was very difficult to explain people about the immunity, serologic tests, and all the unknowns. Actually, I started going into, I mean, being interviewed by journalists in the TV, trying to explain, and trying to explain it to the government about this type of issues, which was kind of difficult. And so what were the consequences of this? Well, one of the consequences, unfortunately, in Peru, was that there were very little efforts to deploy the molecular capacities in the country, feeling very comfortable with rapid tests. And actually, I chair a committee for the government um, as an advisor that is called the uh, Committee for Innovations in uh, COVID. And actually, we realized that, for example, academic laboratories in almost all the regions in Peru were having capacities for molecular testing, but the National Institute of Health didn't want these laboratories to do any molecular tests because they felt very comfortable with the rapid tests and with them doing the, the molecular tests. And actually that has been a real problem um, because we could have during these months increased the number of molecular tests around uh, the, the country. The supplies were available to be purchased, but there were delays due to bureaucratic processes. And now, after several months, through this commission that I chair, we are pushing uh, the discussion because we still need to invest on molecular testing. As Carlos was saying before, we need a mixture of tests and to decide where to use one or the other. The second consequence is that our reported infections are not comparable with other countries. It's true that Peru has been hit very hard now the cases are going down, but when you compare the cases, everybody's reporting mainly molecular tests and we are reporting mainly rapid tests, okay? And a confirmed test, as I said, could be anybody with either a molecular or a rapid test. And the same thing is happening with mortality rates. We have a very good uh, electronic database and electronic system to report mortality, but that database is um, linked now with laboratory tests. So anybody who ever in their lives or during this time had a rapid test or a test that dies is considered a death due to COVID. And so we're having very high mortality rates, but um, maybe those are not reflecting really what is happening. And the other consequence has been this false sense of security. As I told you, it's like this, this issue of if, if we are all in this office have a serologic test negative, we're fine. We can take out our masks or let's take a test, okay? And then visit our relatives or have a party. And uh, we had as a country, I mean, it has been difficult to manage the use of these tests and 
because we didn't have really a communication strategy. Actually, I was telling you that I started talking with the journalists and I was interviewed, etc. And finally, about two weeks ago, I was offered to have a TV program to try to explain these issues. And that's a, the, the career that Rosanna, I don't think it's a career, Rosanna. I think it's just an, an opportunity. I mean, I was uh, trying to explain almost every day, five or six times a day. And now I have this program in which actually I'm trying to even express with, I mean, I, I go in the TV with my mask because I'm teaching people to use the mask, but also I'm trying to break some myth and trying to explain issues. And everybody's asking about diagnostics, you know, it's quite interesting. And I, I'm every day at 4 p.m., 4 to 5, and 10 to 11 with this program. So to conclude, rapid tests had been very use, a very useful alternative to the shortages of molecular testing in Peru. However, one of the things that I, I think it's a very important learning is that we need to work on informing the public, the authorities, the health professionals, and the policymakers about diagnostics for this pandemic, and in general, diagnostics in general. We need to teach them what to expect, when to use it, how to make the interpretations, issues about the quality and what should come next, which means diagnostics is, is a way to understand what is going on, but we need to be sure that we do the next step. And it is not enough with testing. One of the issues that failed in Peru was the communication campaign from my point of view, and the other issue that has failed is really to contain. So we had the contact tracing, but actually we were not able to contain um, for several issues, informality, uh, problems with the government. Um, we, there are several issues that we are analyzing right now. We have to assure that actions are taken according to the results and that healthcare is available when it's needed. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, we will hold the questions uh, until um, uh, the uh, presentations from Europe have been uh, completed because one of our speakers from Europe has to, uh, to, to um, leave soon. So thank you very much, uh, Paddy. So we'll be back to you later. Our next speaker is Dr. Baz Oud um, Munink. Um, he's um, uh, from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. And, um, and he's um, uh, actually spent a year uh, at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute to obtain more bioinformatics uh, knowledge. And uh, he's really interested in working on the monitoring and tracing of uh, emerging arboviruses using a nanopore sen uh, sequencing. And he's working on creating an early warning system for emerging viral pathogens using a variety of different molecular uh, assays and techniques. So over to you. Um, Pass. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for the last minute change in the program. I'm very sorry, but I indeed have to leave within 15 minutes. But I would like to take you along on the, the Dutch situation report. So I should first start with a brief introduction about what's going on in the Netherlands at the moment and how SARS coronavirus 2 got introduced in the Netherlands. And then I will indeed focus mainly on my expertise and that's rapid SARS coronavirus 2 whole genome sequencing. And we've shown now in this epidemic that it, we can actually use it to enable public health decision making if you do this in a timely fashion. So in the Netherlands, SARS coronavirus 2 was first detected on February 22nd. And by now we have around 88,000 cases in the Netherlands, which is quite a significant number. And we could see that after the initial first peak of infection, we were able to get the virus under control. But at the moment we are experienced so-called second wave. So we will see an increase in the number of uh, infections. And just today we had uh, a groundbreaking number of 1,500 positive samples within 24 days. And that's the highest number we've ever detected in the Netherlands. So in the beginning, we were already uh, quite heavily involved in trying to develop SARS coronavirus 2 diagnostics. So already by January, 23rd, we had a, based on the initial release of the first SARS coronavirus 2 genome, 
on the 10th of January, we already developed a real-time uh, PCR to enable the detection of by then still, it was called the 2019 novel uh, coronavirus, later renamed to SARS coronavirus 2. But we already developed this method in the end of January. And we also used that already to start screening suspected cases. So initially, we performed the diagnostics on suspected cases with recent travel history to China. So that's already started uh, somewhere halfway in January. But later on, we noticed that something was going on in Italy and perhaps in Switzerland. So also between the 25th and the 28th of February, we also uh, tested suspected cases with travel history to certain affected municipalities in Northern Italy. And later on, this was also increased to all four Northern provinces in Italy. So everyone with uh, suspected cases, so, so which has symptoms, and travel history to Italy was tested. And after the 11th of March, it was then extended to the entire region of Italy. So by this time, we were still able to, to uh, perform diagnostics on all suspected cases. So this is the so-called first phase, where we did the initial testing of systematic travelers, including the, tra the testing of systematic contacts. But we noticed already quite early on in the epidemic in the second phase that it was not feasible anymore to perform testing on all suspected cases. So then we moved towards another testing strategy where we only screened high risk contacts with continued active case finding in less affected regions, but we stopped the screening of low risk contacts. So we just assumed they had coronavirus, but we did not actually test them. And then in the third phase, we were really running low on reagents and that we included mainly healthcare workers with a low threshold case definition. So all healthcare workers could get tested, but no more screening was done on the high risk contacts. So we're really hampered by the availability of uh, reagents and personnel to perform the testing. So that's also why the case numbers are relatively low in the first phase. Well, if we were able to test everyone, this would be most probably a lot higher, but we're simply not able to test such huge numbers of, uh, of patients. So here's a little bit about uh, the testing policy and the implementation of uh, measurements to try to control the spread of SARS coronavirus 2 in the Netherlands. So after we performed the first PCR test on the 22nd of January, it lasted over a month before we found the first PCR positive case. So this was only one month later after we started the testing. But then we saw that the virus was spreading rapidly. And by the 9th of March, we had the first intervention put into place. And by the 12th of March, this also included the closure of schools, uh, catering industries and sport clubs. And by the 15th of March, we already went into the third phase, where we were simply running out of tests and we just started to screen uh, the priority healthcare workers and uh, related patients. And we also tried to embed a sequencing effort into, uh, into this. So by the 22nd of March, we generated already almost 190 whole genome sequences of SARS coronavirus 2, which were collected during the second and the third phase. And were also uh, yeah, directly used to, uh, to inform the public to see how the virus was spreading throughout the community. So that will be the, the focus of the second uh, part of my talk. And that's the use of whole genome sequencing for outbreak investigations. So we heard already some words about sequencing already. And we mainly use it now at the moment to determine where is the virus coming from? How different is it from what we've seen before? Is it part of an outbreak? And is it part of a transmission cluster? So for this, we used the fuelable nanopore main ion sequencing. So it's pretty technical, this slide, but the main advantage is that it's really fast. It's relatively cheap. And that's real-time base calling. So you can really use it in a timely fashion. And we use now an amplicon-based uh, sequencing approach. So we just do a simple PCR uh, amplifying overlapping amplicons of the entire SARS coronavirus 2 genome, which we then pull and use for the library preparation on the nanopore sequencing platform. And this is indeed a handheld machine, so you can do it almost everywhere. And just to demonstrate this, uh, one and a half month ago, we also went to Suriname and we took along our sequencer and we also performed whole genome sequencing in Suriname. 
So we were able to get 91 full genomes in two weeks time. So after that, there's still a little bit of the biogenetic part, but should not be underestimated. So after we generated all these different amplicons, we tried to reconstruct the whole genome. And by now we've performed almost 160 sequence runs, which also generates quite a large amount of data. So back to the beginning when the outbreak just started in the Netherlands. <clears throat> so the first case was confirmed on the 22nd of February, and there was one additional case one day later. And we could see based on the genomes of these virus, which we generated within 48 hours after the initial detection, that they were not from one source. So they were unlikely connected and most probably represent two different introductions into the Netherlands. And then later on, we uh, did this systematically. So we generated the sequences within 24 or 48 hours after the initial diagnosis. And we could see that there were uh, several different introductions into the Netherlands of patients with known travel history, mainly to Italy, but that there also was some local uh, circulation of the virus. So we could also find the virus in people without travel history. And at this moment, this was the 15th of March, we also uh, tried to release as much data as possible to GISAID. So but at that time, the amount of sequences generated from the Netherlands represented over 27% of the total number of sequences produced worldwide. So really one of the early, uh, in the early response in using whole genome sequencing and trying to see what this virus is, uh, how this virus is spreading. But then later on, we also detected that the sequences we found in the Netherlands were pretty diverse. So we saw several different clusters occurring. And we also saw the core circulation of different sequence types. But the travel history was not the main point anymore. So it's not like that people were traveling and importing the virus into the Netherlands. But we could really see that the virus was spreading within the Netherlands. And that also led to, to more strict public health measurements. So this result directly led to uh, an increase in movement restrictions. So this was really, uh, yeah, causing uh, the lockdown to be, uh, to be that the country went into a more strict lockdown to prevent the further spread of the virus. So we could see here that uh, using whole genome sequence in combination with epidemiological data, because that remains really important, strengthened the evidence-based uh, for public health decision making in the Netherlands. So we could really uh, put a number on it when the diagnostics were not uh, available anymore. And the combination of real-time whole genome sequencing in combination with the data from the national public health response team provided some useful information that helped to decide uh, the next steps in the public health decision making. But in order to fully capitalize the potential added value of whole genome sequencing, we need to combine it. We need a combined analysis of data that are in agreement with the general data protection rules because we were struggling quite a bit with collecting the metadata. So most of the time since genome sequence was not generated before we were able to collect the associated metadata. And then just a little uh, small slide about what we are currently doing using whole genome sequencing. So currently we're still sequencing quite a bit. So we want to determine the geographical signature if there's any. We want to monitor significant changes in the genome if they started to appear. And we do a lot of outbreak investigations, for instance, in hospitals, in nursing homes, slaughterhouses, gyms, schools, fruit industry, and you name it. We try to investigate all different clusters and try to see what's going on in particular situations. And we're also investigating now on mink farms, what's going on there. And that will be my last slide. So this is just an example of a zoom in of the phylogeny on mink farms. So the main thing I want to make here is just that everyone is aware of this, that minks <clears throat> can be infected quite easily with such coronavirus too. And also employees got infected from the minks, most probably. So the proof of mink to human infection is that they got, uh, the employees got infected after we detected the virus in minks. And we can also see that clustering in the phylogenetic tree. So you just see the sequences from humans, which are depicted in blue. They cluster deeply within the, the mink sequences. And it seems to be forming a few uh, very distinct clusters. Uh, we we're also able to detect the virus in air samples close to the mink farms. So within the mink farms, we could detect the virus in the air. And although not all uh, cases are most probably related to, uh, can be traced back to minks, because there can also be family clusters, we do see in at least three or four cases that there was mink to human transmission. 
And one other striking thing is, was that uh, when we tested the make farm employees, over 86% of all tested uh, employees tested positive either serological or by PCR. And we tested them also while being asymptomatic. So working at mink farms is really an increased risk in getting uh, yeah, SARS-CoV-2 virus infection. And then of course, I would like to acknowledge all these people who contributed with samples and helped me with, uh, yeah, with doing this work. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for making the time to uh, tell us about the valuable information that we could get from uh, sequencing, which is um, not something that's normally talked about uh, as part of the public health message. But thank you very much. And, um, and, and now we like to go towards the, um, the second uh, presentation from Europe, uh, which is uh, given by uh, Professor uh, Eva Broberg. Uh, she's an expert in virology at the European uh, CDC in Stockholm, Sweden. And in her role as the deputy head of the influenza and other uh, respiratory uh, virus disease program, she focuses on surveillance threat at detection of all diseases that are incorporated into the program, uh, mainly influenza. And her work uh, also involves coordinating the European uh, Reference Laboratory Network for Human Influenza. In addition, she's involved in the development of HIV resistance monitoring on a pan-European level. And so uh, right now, uh, we'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor Boberg uh, to give the uh, um, European um, laboratory response to COVID. Thank you very much. Um, Rosanna, I hope you hear me well. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation and uh, good afternoon from, uh, from Europe to all regions. Um, I thought I would start with a slide um, on European CDC as um, our institute was established only in 2005 and you may not be maybe well uh, aware of all uh, what we do. So we have an, um, a responsibility to identify, assess and communicate current and emerging threats to human health posed by infectious diseases. Uh, we focus on surveillance, microbiology, preparedness, um, country support, scientific advice, public health training, health communication, epidemic intelligence and outbreak response. And on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you see the disease areas that we work in. Uh, you have to note that the uh, European CDC does not do crisis management. So that is a responsibility that belongs to the European Union's uh, um, commission. So that's why that is not listed um, on the topics that we uh, we work in. So we are a scientific independent agency of the European Union and we mainly focus on, on surveillance and uh, preparedness. So to start my talk on the, on the COVID uh, European laboratory response, I go back in time to January and, um, and give this timeline to you of the early events. Um, European uh, CDC uh, does a lot of epidemic intelligence activities and so quite early on and uh, actually on the new, new Year's Eve we picked the signal from China um, on the at that point still unknown pneumonia and, um, uh, and then uh, quite early on in, um, in uh, January on the 9th of uh, January WHO confirmed uh, the novel coronavirus that had been isolated and on the following day uh, the sequence was already made available as you very well know. So then it went very quickly in four days time uh, the, the Charité laboratory, Christian Gorston's laboratory in, in Berlin in, uh, in Europe published the first PCR assay and, uh, and also the positive controls were made available from uh, the European Virus Archive. And I, I hope you all have also benefited of these reagents that are uh, available globally. Uh, there was also a, um, 
a coronavirus specificity panel that was made available from the European Virus Archive uh, on the 16th of January already. And then we from the European CDC side, we wanted to um, know a little bit how fast the laboratories in Europe are moving towards uh, establishing diagnostics uh, for COVID. So we did a mapping uh, of these activities in the end of uh, January. And um, this map shows you the situation on the 29th of January after our mapping activities. Uh, so first of all, to, uh, I don't need to speak to you about the crucial role of the laboratories uh, to detect the, um, the virus and, and to interrupt virus spread. But um, this map shows the, the status of availability of molecular diagnostics um, for novel coronavirus, as it was called still at that time, uh, in the uh, European Union and the European Economic Area countries. Um, those were 46 laboratories in these countries that had already uh, established or um, had aims to establish the, the molecular assays by mid-February which is shown in uh, lighter color there, uh, the countries who established it by mid-February. So we had a relatively good situation in, in Europe early on. Um, and, um, uh, and I have to mention to you also that uh, the Euro European CDC does not have laboratories of its own. So we work with the network of laboratories. We offer uh, support to laboratories through this network um, uh, and the national laboratories then obviously also uh, they have their own national laboratory networks that support um, uh, each other. Uh, you are all familiar with the WHO referral, referral laboratory system. There are six of these laboratories in the uh, European Union uh, and UK area. So. Um, so Europe is, is well um, equipped with referral laborat laboratories. And then we, from ECDC side, we established the European COVID-19 Reference Laboratory Network uh, through nominations uh, by the countries. Uh, this is something we do regularly for all disease areas, and, and so we wanted to do this also for, for COVID. And um, we combine these networks with our surveillance networks where we then have also the epidemiologists uh, taking part. We host weekly meetings uh, with the joint um, um, uh, group uh, of the epidemiologists and, and lab people. And, and then on top, we also have lab specific discussions um, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Many of you have, uh, or other speakers have also spoken about uh, laboratory shortages. And we did um, uh, experience this also in Europe, as Bas also mentioned, uh, quite early on already in, in March, we, we mapped uh, this situation also in the countries. Uh, there were issues uh, for uh, purchasing or receiving consumables, reagents, personal protective equipment, disinfectants um, and uh, this affected obviously the, the sampling, the, the whole testing process and um, one area of difficulty was is especially the RNA extraction for the molecular testing and therefore the European Commission then uh, went forward with uh, EU-wide joint procurement we know that these uh, issues have not gone away and uh, we are fearing that we will have again the global shortages uh, that will affect also Europe now during the upcoming fall and, and winter. So, so this is um, a, a true learning case, I, th I believe, for all of us um, globally uh, that we are very much affected by the production uh, in, in certain countries and, and areas and, and then the different purchasing um, orders. And, and so this is really a, a, a true problem that we will need to solve somehow at the international level. So obviously ECDC's um, one of main areas is to monitor the, the epidemic and um, there the detections and the laboratory work plays a crucial role. 
Here you see an, um, a 14 day COVID-19 case notification rate now uh, by 13th of, of September. Uh, the countries are in quite a variable uh, epidemic situation at the moment. Uh, there are regions uh, where you see in, in blue color uh, where no cases have been reported in the past two weeks. But there are also many regions and especially uh, Spain now uh, hit quite heavily uh, by the second wave uh, and uh, with more than 120 uh, cases of COVID-19 reported by 100,000 uh, population. If we then look at the overall epidemic until now from, from January um, and the 14-day case notification, uh, rates here shown in, in blue curve and then also the death notification uh, rate uh, shown in green. Uh, we see that the, uh, the case numbers have, um, have reached almost the, the peak of the, the first wave and uh, so the situation in Europe is escalating. However, now the cases are more uh, milder and uh, and many are asymptomatic. Also, the testing policies affect this a lot. Boss mentioned the different uh, testing policies in Netherlands, um, and this has changed a lot in Europe lately. Um, uh, the testing is more widely available than in the, uh, during the first wave, and, uh, and therefore we believe that the more mild cases also are, are detected as people have more access to, to get tested. Uh, what is positive in this figure um, is that the deaths have not increased um, uh, similarly that um, the cases. So um, altogether we have now um, 2.6 million cases uh, detected in the EU, EA and UK and uh, more than 180,000 uh, deaths. So then um, of interest to this audience, uh, I, I believe is the testing volumes. And this is one indicator that we, uh, we monitor in the region. And uh, in the top um, left corner, uh, I'm not sure you see my mouse, uh, but, but here we have the testing volumes um, uh, in totals by week and you see the huge increase in the testing volumes. Uh, the testing volumes are also very variable uh, across the country, so you have to pay attention to the uh, different uh, y-axis here, uh, where some countries are testing more than thousand um, or several thousands even um, uh, per 100,000 population per week, uh, when as other countries are testing uh, in ranges of hundreds of tests uh, per 100,000 per week. And then another indicator that we uh, look at is the proportion positive specimens. And again, in the left hand uh, upper corner, you see the EU, EA and UK totals uh, for the uh, positivity rate. And there we see very um, clearly the first wave uh, and then a slight increase now uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the fall. Uh, but we don't see yet a, a huge increase uh, in the positivity rates. And, um, and, and so all of this is obviously um, affected by the, test, the different testing policies. And uh, here again, uh, we think that now we are seeing uh, milder cases, maybe uh, less uh, viral load than in the hospitalized that were uh, mainly tested in the, in the first uh, wave. So we are following this very carefully. Many of, of uh, the other speakers have also uh, touched upon the test performance already. And this is also that, uh, something that we started monitoring uh, quite early on. Uh, in April, we, uh, we invited countries uh, to submit results for a test performance for clinical evaluations of um, molecular antibody, antigen, uh, and uh, point of care tests. And uh, until now, contributions have been made by 12 member states. Um, and uh, we've also performed a literature review 
uh, with more than 102 studies included and with more than 77,000 test results uh, included. And we've submitted this um, paper now uh, yesterday. And, and so I hope it comes soon available also in the preprint services so that um, you can have a look at the results as I um, in uh, interest of time I cannot go into those now but quite interesting results there. Another area that we are focusing on and that um, was uh, already introduced from the Dutch perspective is the geographical and temporal distribution of the different SARS-CoV-2 plagues. We did a big uh, collaboration, international collaboration between uh, European CDC, WHO uh, regional office in Europe, European uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing laboratories from 35 countries with uh, more than 39,000 sequences um, were included in this study. And we also had representatives from GISAID and NextTrain and um, uh, Scottish Rambo et al uh, nomenclature providers. And we applied these different uh, uh, nomenclature systems to the sequence data and drew some broad conclusions about the genetic clades dominating in, um, in Europe so far, which have been now mainly the 20, uh, clade 20A and, and, um, and even um, more recently now the uh, clade 20B. And uh, you can have a look at the, the um, uh, results more, more in detail than in the, in the publication, the, the references on the bottom of the slide. Something that we've developed ourselves, uh, our bioinformatician has, has developed a primary scanning tool. And uh, this tool is available to all of you. Uh, the link is on the, on the upper right corner of the slide. And this um, slide shows, or the tool shows, the match between publicly available PCR primer and probe sets and genomes available in GISA and aggregated over geographic regions and months. And uh, it shows also the, the uh, mutations uh, in the primer and probe sites uh, and uh, that those are still rare. Uh, but that some assays have primary design issues. And so it's important that all of you um, in the laboratories check these primaries and probes that you use uh, quite frequently so that there would not be any, any issues um, uh, in those. Uh, I want to, um, in the end now, also flag a couple of items that we have ongoing. Um, we are um, heavily involved in the seroprevalence monitoring in Europe. Uh, we have established a separate network uh, to connect the countries who are performing seroprevalence monitoring. And uh, we are collating those results together with uh, Euro, uh, WHO Euro. Um, uh, We've done mapping of, of capacities in the countries and, um, and also what methods they use. Uh, we are performing also external quality assessments from ECDC side with our member state laboratories. Um, we've just finished the first round, which was focusing on RT-PCR and RNA extraction. And now we are starting a second round with the, with the serology assays. Uh, we are looking into the country and overall European testing strategies. Now, one uh, other topic that is hot on the list is the reinfections, uh, long-term shedding of viral RNA, and how we can also, with diagnostic methods, separate the um, a, a possible reinfection from the first one. So I'm uh, curious to hear if, if other regions are discussing uh, this at the moment. And to finish off, I, I would like to leave you with uh, some websites uh, with our guidance documents. We have developed uh, uh, both on the EPI and lab side quite many uh, guidances. So you're welcome to, uh, to view those and use those. And uh, also our surveillance outputs, um, mainly the country overview reports and, um, and also our data dashboard. 
And uh, here are the acknowledgements to my international colleagues and then to uh, my team uh, at the ECDC for the mi microbiology support. Thank you very much for your attention and, and um, having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think in the um, interest of time, uh, we like to only ask one question uh, per speaker. It's, it's just been, uh, you know, very rich uh, presentations with lots of content. But un unfortunately, we, we do have a restriction on the time, especially since our colleagues in, in Asia are facing um, a, 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 it's in the evening already. And so, uh, first of all, a question to, to Carlos. Um, are there um, uh, official recommendations for testing strategies from the Latin America countries? And then a question to uh, Patricia uh, for a triage of people with positive RDTs but no symptoms. What do you do? those two questions first, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Professor Broberg and, and her question later. Excellent question, Rosanna. I think in, in the case of Latin America, what we see is that BAHO for quite a long time, and even WHO, was basically supporting just the molecular, just RT-PCR as a kind of testing strategy. But that was not uh, the reality for most of the countries, like Patricia indicated because they were lacking of instruments or even capacity. So each country actually has been taking their own initiatives and these uh, policies have been evolving. So we see uh, many different situations, like the case of Brazil, the official number of positive cases is indeed a mixture of PCR, uh, antigen, and also antibody tests. And why? Because it's not only public institutions, but also private labs and uh, other institutions have to report all positive cases to a central network, central database. So I would say, answer simply, there is no overall strategy because it's a combination. Uh, initial recommendation of PCR or the symptomatic cases, but uh, a group of different uh, diagnostic strategies per country on a country by country basis. Thank you, Carlos. And Patty. Oh, we got you. the algorithm or how to manage people with no symptoms and a rapid test positive. Okay, so that was an initial and I think a continuous problem because the recommendation in theory is rapid test either IgM or IgG positive, people had to stay in quarantine 14 days, okay? And, but because some of the policies of the government, um, and actually they were not coming from the Ministry of Health, they were coming from the Ministry of Labor, was to do rapid tests for the workers, depending on the risk, the type of work that will have more risk, they have to repeat the rapid test every week or every two weeks, et cetera. So that meant that some people that had already a rapid test, they will have another rapid test and they could stay in quarantine, I mean, for several weeks. So that is changing right now. But in general, we're trying to push for one rapid test. If it is positive, quarantine 14 days. And, um, and the other thing that we're trying to see is trying to see if we can push to identify if this was the index case or it was just a contact. But this is something that is evolving. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, thank you. And uh, to uh, Professor Broberg, um, with the um, most virulent strains that you've identified, what is the speed of spread? Is there a difference between different strains um, uh, in terms of their spread? And um, because in Europe, you, you have a lot of really good data on this. Yes, uh, thank you. So what an interesting uh, question. So, and a very difficult to answer. So um, uh, first of all, at the moment, we haven't really seen uh, different virulence uh, in the strains. We also don't see different antigenicity. So, um, the viruses are still 
uh, fairly similar, even if a lot of mutations have uh, already occurred. Uh, but we don't really see um, uh, phenotypic changes. Um, and we are, of course, carefully monitoring the situation um, together with the hospital uh, data or this uh, syndromic data, the clinical data. Um, and especially UK is doing a huge uh, sequencing a project now, I think they have submitted more than 29,000 sequences or something like that and um, from the European uh, region. And, and so um, there are a lot of research efforts going into this. Um, but at the moment, I, I think it's too early to say um, the mutation rate of coronaviruses is luckily uh, slower than for HIV and also for influenza. So uh, for the respiratory infections, um, we are quite used to see, uh, for example, in influenza surveillance, uh, the change over the seasons and, um, uh, and, and therefore, obviously, the vaccine needs to be updated uh, so, so frequently. But for a coronavirus, uh, the mutation rate is slightly slower, so around two mutations per month. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, uh, we continue monitoring this. Thank you very much. And, and now, uh, last but not least, we will go to Asia. And our first speaker for Asia is uh, Dr. Essel Salvana, who's the director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology uh, at the NIH uh, at the University of Philippines, uh, Manila. And uh, Esso is an infectious disease physician and also uh, a very well-known public health um, uh, specialist. His uh, research work has focused on changing molecular epidemiology of HIV in Southeast Asia and is working on mobile um, sequencing tech technologies. Um, he's been at the forefront of efforts to restore uh, vaccine confidence, uh, uh, especially in, 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 with regard to, to dengue. And, uh, and he's constantly seeking ways to communicate complicated scientific concepts to a lay audience, which we all struggle with. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, he believes that that's the best way to combat pseudoscience and fake views. Now over to you, Esso. Uh, thank you very much, Rosanna. Um, it's evening here in Asia. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. So it's a pleasure uh, to attend this, uh, to participate in this webinar. So I'd just like to uh, spend about 10 minutes talking about um, the, uh, uh, the Philippine story uh, of COVID. Um, and we were one of the earliest countries to shut down and uh, whether that was a good idea or not. So um, this is our timeline. And uh, basically our first three cases of COVID uh, uh, happened in January, towards the end of January. And these were all uh, imported cases, all Chinese nationals. And uh, because of this, we actually ended up banning travel from China. Um, uh, unfortunately, one of those three was the first death outside China ever. So we got some bad press from that. But the other two recovered. They returned to China. And we didn't have cases for, for almost a month. And at this point, because we know that the uh, long incubation period of uh, COVID is about 14 days, we had two long incubation periods without a case. And so WHO at that point said, you know, um, it looks like uh, the Philippines was able to contain that for those first three cases. Unfortunately, a couple of days later, we reported our next two new cases, and uh, these were both Filipinos. One had come home from Japan, uh, but the other one actually had no travel history. And this was very concerning um, uh, for those of us uh, who, who were following this because we knew that uh, is there any kind of uh, hidden community transmission, and uh, we actually did advise the government that we have to escalate. And so this was a level one, uh, you know, they were, they canceled classes in the locality. And this was just a 10 cases. And then a few days later, when we started to see more cases at 52 cases, we actually um, uh, recommended a generalized community quarantine, which uh, pretty much uh, 
cuts back on uh, movement by about 50%. And as more cases came, we actually drastically uh, shut down the entire um, uh, national capital region or the NCR, which includes uh, Manila, uh, bigger metro Manila, about 12 million people, and then the whole island of Luzon. And this is one of the earliest uh, lockdowns in a developing country. Uh, we shut down the capital and then actually the whole island of Luzon. Uh, we did peak at about 538 cases uh, uh, towards the end of March. And you can see that there's a little bracket there um, showing that, uh, but uh, fairly flat. Um, now, the reason for locking down 52 cases actually, uh, and I was involved in that decision because there were four of us that were advising the government at that time. And uh, uh, we knew that uh, China, Italy, and Spain were being overwhelmed. And uh, they probably considered locking down a conventional threshold. So we knew that this was probably uh, too late if we were going to wait for a strong evidence of community-based transmission. And we know that from the WHO report from Wuhan that the only thing that really affected the R, the R not the RT, uh, was, was the stringent lockdown. And there were also reports at that point that the R night might be up, up to 3 or 3.5. We knew our healthcare capacity was maybe 10% of that of the United States and certainly much lower than those other countries uh, that I mentioned. So uh, we actually thought that our only fighting chance was to have an early lockdown, uh, especially because we knew that there was a high density of people in the national capital region. And so in April and May, actually, we were more or less able to keep the cases low, although, of course, we were scrambling uh, to do enough uh, testing as well. So there were some backlogs and there were some days where, uh, you know, you would have a big dump of cases because they were working through backlogs. Um, but it looked promising enough that the government started to ease the lockdown after about 10 weeks, which is one of the longest in the world. Um, and then uh, the, some of the pro early projections of our own scientists were they were using Iran as a model because there was no widespread lockdown. And uh, we were um, actually uh, pretty pleased that it looked like we were curbing the, the cases, although, again, the, the, the testing was still catching up at that point. Uh, as we eased the lockdown, though, um, we started to see some increase in cases, some were backlogs, and then there was a second epicenter in one of the major cities in the country, uh, Cebu City, and so uh, they actually ended up locking down as well. And then in July, uh, our cases have continued to increase. Um, Cebu actually started to get better, and they flattened after they, they did a, a lockdown. Um, the NCR, National Capital Region, continued to rise, and then when we started to see our healthcare uh, utilization approaching the critical level, we actually briefly shut down for another two week period uh, in August. And then after that, uh, we, there were signs of flattening. And then now we're holding at about three to 4,000 cases a day. Um, still uh, not ideal, but uh, at least it's not going up anymore. And uh, just uh, to show actually today, we've already done more than 3.1 million uh, tests. Uh, the positivity rate is about 10%, so we'd like to see that better. Um, and uh, we have about 53,000 active cases at this time. The deaths have actually been surprisingly low, uh, 4,630. Um, and again, this is a country of 109 million people. And our deaths are actually less than, you know, about one-tenth that of uh, Italy, France, um, you know, comparable countries. So that is um, a bright spot in all of this. Uh, the testing actually has ramped up uh, in fits and starts initially. We only had, we could only do about 300 tests a day in January, uh, but now we're, our testing capacity is, is about 40,000 a day. Uh, the daily positivity rate um, from the start, initially we were only testing symptomatics and then the, the, we were able to start testing um, asymptomatic uh, close contacts as well. And you can see that the um, the positivity rate did start to go down and then started to go back up again as our number of cases uh, came up, as well as there was more aggressive contact tracing. So maybe that also um, increased the pickup rate uh, because we were aggressively going after close contacts. Um, our, again, our fatality rate is actually fairly uh, good at 1.74%. Um, a positivity rate needs some improvement. And our current uh, reproduction rate is... Uh, our RT is about 0.75, so it's below one, so um, we just have to keep uh, going with this. Um, and then the deaths, uh, as I mentioned, have been surprisingly low for the number of cases we've had. 
uh, but it's starting to pick up again uh, after it had actually gone down uh, in April. And now um, uh, it, it, it seems to be flat, but uh, we're, we're keeping a close eye on this. Uh, the cases have actually been mostly 20 to 40 year old, but most of the deaths have been in the uh, older ages, 60 and above. Um, currently, this is our capacity, um, so we've actually been able to do a better job at, uh, at controlling the surge and protecting our healthcare system. Um, just some genomic data, and I'll show the trees after this, uh, but uh, these were from, this is from a study from about 17 whole genomes. And in January, these were the three Chinese cases, and they were lineage A and B. Um, and uh, so the question was whether the March cases were related, and they were not, actually. And uh, it seemed like the, the, the lineages were from D6. And then um, we actually also reported some D614 variants from June. And we, we had actually repatriated about 170,000 overseas workers. And so even though we were trying to test these and doing quarantine, um, you know, you just know that uh, there was more introduction going on because we had actually locked down most uh, inbound travel except for returning residents. And uh, there aren't that many genomes in, uh, in, uh, in next train, uh, but what we can see here is uh, early on they were uh, D61, uh, they were, they, they were D614, uh, and then there was that one G614. There have been more sequences that have been done, uh, but they haven't made their way to the next train yet. Um, and again, uh, this had been alluded to, uh, you know, there is an issue of whether G614 is more transmissible. Um, and so, uh, but uh, we know that it's in the Philippines uh, with, with some of the sequencing that we've done. So best practices, I, we, I think that one of the best things we did was really shut down early and the World Bank and uh, other institutions have calculated that this prevented tens of thousands of deaths and hundreds of thousands of cases. Uh, we were able to increase our isolation beds and critical care capacity during our lockdown period. Um, there was early flattening and so our healthcare workers were able to learn to manage COVID properly. And so that's why uh, we have one of the lowest absolute death rates in the top 25 cases in the world, even though we have so many cases. And uh, this is just some modeling from uh, one of our uh, from one of our partners. And, uh, you know, you're just wondering what would happen if we had hesitated to lock down. And this is the effect of a two week delay in the lockdown in the national capital region of about 12 million people. And you can see that even though now the number of cases are starting to catch up early on, there would have been a major surge, which uh, we would not have been able to handle in terms of our healthcare capacity. And a lot of those people would have died. So I think that uh, locking down was really prudent. Uh, from missteps, you know, um, we know that we were able to prevent uh, more Chinese uh, um, viruses coming in, uh, but unfortunately, we had multiple introductions from the returning workers, and uh, this includes the D614 variant. Um, we also had an issue with unregulated use of rapid antibody tests, and this may have exacerbated the cases uh, due to false negatives as well. And so the lessons learned, um, you know, is that we need to uh, really do strict implementation of minimum health standards, uh, granular lockdowns as we open up, quarantines on incoming travelers, uh, thinking about entire household quarantine and isolation of incident cases with rapid contact testing. Um, and now we're looking at maybe using antigen testing. We have a homegrown uh, PCR kit as well. Uh, pooled PCR has been validated as well as saliva and thinking about second generation antibody testing, ELISAs and CLIAs uh, for uh, zero surveys, but not for active infection. And this is just a picture of uh, the homegrown RT-PCR that we do have and uh, is starting to be used already just to augment capacity. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esso, and uh, lots of things for us to think about. And, and now we'll go directly to our uh, uh, last uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Ganguly has been with ACDX right from the very, very beginning, and, uh, and we really welcome him back to give the, the last lecture to conclude our webinar series. Uh, Professor Ganguly is the former Director General of the Indian Council for Medical Research and also formerly a Distinguished bio Biotechnology Research Professor at the Department of Biotechnology at the Government of India. And uh, he holds many, many uh, titles and, and have been director of many uh, initiatives. 
Um, I think that uh, uh, he has been um, the general president of the Indian Science Congress Association and former president of the National Academy of Medical Sciences in, in New Delhi. And uh, so, so with that, I'd like to invite Professor Ganguly to give us an overview of um, what the situation is like in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. It was nice to again connect with you. You have been a great patron, always supporting us uh, to the NSC meetings. And they really built up the capacity all around. I think your sound is off. Um, can you unmute? Okay, yeah. yeah, I have unmuted. Am okay. I am I unmuted now? So yeah. what I was uh, saying, Rosanna, that thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this meet. It was uh, tremendous to be again back with you. I will start with the story that for three days I was having fever and uh, my oxygen, SpO2 was 94, and uh, I had cough and, uh, and, and uh, running nose. So I went to the test today in my own lab, and this was uh, RT-PCR, antigen test, and antibody test. I got the result of all the three in flat one hour and few minutes. So this is how now, in India, people are getting the results. They are getting the results in the, in the first day when they provide the sample. Previously, the cycle was... Professor Ganguly, you're muted again. Can you unmute? Yeah, just for the last few seconds, yeah. So... Thank you. Oh. Unmuted again. So no. what I was saying that now you can get, although it was my lab, so I got it perhaps early, but within one day you are getting the reports. And these reports previously were five day cycle or more than that. And that actually made it very difficult for contract tracing. The reports go to your app, which is in your mobile phone and then it goes to a central data storage and it goes to the region where you live so that the contact tracing starts occurring. It sometimes leads to stigma that people are ostracized and sometimes they are ostracized in the living habitats. So, but um, overall, the thing has worked in India. If, if I go to the next slide, please. Somebody is moving my slides. So if I go to the next slide, please. Okay. So in Asia is a very large uh, continent with the largest population. If you make China, India, um, the Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and others, we have, we have almost more than half the population, uh, global population, very many countries, very many cultures, and uh, very many relationships. So if you if we really look at where we got the data from Philippines, but this is overall, if, if we are looking at the test positivity rate, this is September 8, test positivity rate in India is 7.9%, Iran is 7.7%, Pakistan, I don't know why it is 1.9%, but South Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, their testing positive rate are even less than 1%. And South Korea, of course, is 1%, but the rest of Malaysia has done tremendously well. So these are the countries which have done well, and there are countries who have not done that well. If we, if we look at the case fatality rate, case fatality rate has been low in Asia. There, is, there are many theories about that, but essentially it has been low. In India, it is 1.7. In Bangladesh, it is 1.4. Malaysia, it is 1.3. And then there are countries which have less than 0.1%. So this has, there, there are many reasons for this. One of the, some theories which go around that BCG vaccination, et cetera, et cetera, I will not go into the details, but essentially 
this uh, these are theories only none of them are proven but while we were in the pandemic and we were moving we actually improved our infrastructure so 60% or 70% of beds in the hospital and private hospitals were 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 put for the covid cases and icu uh, seats were enhanced the the uh, the ventilators were imported and made in india in a very big way all ppes were made in india so these are some of the things which actually helped in in uh, treating covid appropriately and management management uh, principles were established however the other patients with cancer and other major things the surgery etc they they actually dropped because people didn't have faith to go to hospital next slide please next slide please so if we really look at the map in india there are we created uh, actually to our system our first three cases were students in kerala who returned from wuhan and uh, the and this was 17 were foreigners 64 were uh, indians and death was one and three recovered and this was in the kerala and kerala government was very happy that they have been able to do a very good job it is not so now so if we really look at we really try to create hotspots you can see the hotspots and we have red zone green zones and gray zones and we really put them into practice the policies were laid down by icmr as well as the health ministry but we had a little problem in testing strategy initially only icmr and abhi pune was the apex laboratory there were 13 research laboratories and the ncdc and then there were 28 collection laboratories so they had different roles which were given to them but they Professor Ganguly, can you unmute, please? Just, it just, just works. Why? Yeah. So, oh. so if we really look at that, we look at that, this, this number of laboratories were very small in countries, uh, in a country like India. It changed. Next, please. It has changed now. Next. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So if we see in the first January, there was only one lab which was performed, performing. It performed only 49 things. February, it moved to 13 labs. Now it has moved to about, um, about 1 million tests a day it has moved. And there, were, there are many major platforms which have been put up in the cities. These are the COBAS and other, other platforms which actually churn out large number of uh, uh, reports. Uh, they, uh, the, uh, the, uh, so this was uh, something which was very, very problematic. We had one of the very uh, rigorous lockdown and now we are in the unlockdown five and something like that. And there was a huge migrant population which moved in India to their homes because they lost their houses and jobs. And they, they took this to the rural India and now it has gone to rural India. As previously it was only the metro cities, it has gone to rural India as well as uh, as well as smaller cities. Next, please. So we do not know really the number. Please add ten percent more numbers. So if we really look at our strategy was that ICMR, NCDC, AIMS, etc. There were two twelve new, uh, new testing machines which were put up. Then there were research laboratories of the CSR and DST, and then research institutes were put uh, mentioned put in. Then the system we had lot of uh, the CFID for the tuberculosis diagnosis and TrueNAT, Chandrasekhar, Malbios, TrueNAT, which was there for tuberculosis diagnosis. These were actually put for uh, the COVID diagnosis, and we had a we had all the things 
the viva manufacturing lab the rtpcr imaging etc artificial intelligence also helped in moving things and bio sensors pocd paper based devices many of these were developed within india so india very developed very fast these things but the regulation as i had seen in rosana's place the normally these are validated in international in india icm are validated all the tests next please so the india's evolving testing strategy also move like previously it was only symptomatic as it was in philippines or international travel contacts confirmed cases in june rapid point of care test rapid antigen test into hotspots and healthcare settings it was introduced now you can uh, uh, in the containment zones it is 100% rapid antigen test and test on demand has been introduced you can go and demand a test so so this particular uh, uh, the rapid antigen test also actually moved the thing but ultimately in the algorithm if i i will show in the next slide next slide please in our algorithm even if it is done you will have to do an rt pcr test if it is negative so this is something which is which this algorithm is being followed for the diagnostic for routine surveillance pool rt pcr testing zero prevalence studies and antibody test so huge number of things apart from the diagnostic has moved into the algorithm this is something which is very interesting because uh, because uh, this uh, ha, ha, this is now creating data sets which we could really use next please next please next so there is the first zero surveillance and cdc and delhi government june 27 july 10 22.8 acha yes mane this slide was jumped so we we have now about five labs who have a who have a novasic and no novasic 6000 and we are creating library populations of different library population please go back to the slide mane i you have missed many slides few slides please go back to that last slide i'm sorry so so what i want to say that we have been able to um, next slide please this i'll go next slide next slide i should have i don't know this was not the slide uh, some uh, my slides have been jumbled up so uh, so what i was trying to say yeah this is the slide so say i had 3072 results in 12 hours on the nova 66000 scalable configuration up to 3000 samples better sensitivity compared to rt pcr cost and turnaround comparable to rt pcr sars non cov2 whole genome sequence 469 so this is uh, this this is something which we have been able to now publish and now six laboratories are doing this so we have lot of sequence analysis i will show you some of the dendrograms but i do not find them they were of just after this so in these dendrograms we find two variants uh, which have uh, which which are predominated one has next please one has uh, uh, replaced the other next please next slide i should have moved my own slides next slide please next slide yeah these are the dendrograms so these are the major indian clades 1 a31 and a2a then there are all other clades which have been reported around the world and these these are missense variants out of them and and this particular data comes from our our collaboration with oregon the this particular thing was a uh, mutation was shown by philippines also we are able to say that who will go for ventilator use who will go for icu admission or acu admission or who will remain in outpatient this has been just published we there is a indian group in nccs and we have now two major collaborations in india so the sequence data actually could be used 
but there is only 188 subjects uh, sequences so we can't say that but there is a possibility future possibility with this next please next slide please in india that slide i am not finding any more next slide please next slide yeah in india we created large number of indigenous innovation and future world. so we have a crispr based strip test which is known as Feluda, very with a collaboration with Tata, mass spectrometry based test. This, this could be done very rapid, 30 minutes test. We have published this. RTPCR kits, MyLab, ProFree, CoroShore, COVID Shore, a huge number of such uh, things have come up and they have been scaled up also. RT lamb test, uh, there are four companies which are creating RT lamb test, which is isothermic and results are much quicker. Oscar Corona antibody test, COVID-19, IgG, IgM, IgA. This is done by Mitra Brothers, etc. And there are mobile labs with BSL2 facilities which are going to the different locations and performing RT-PCR and other biochemistry analysis. The next one is perhaps my last slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. So success stories and lessons learned. There's a Wuhan, China. There, there's a harsh, complete nationwide lockdown. Diagnostic tests are available within two weeks of reported cases. Leveraging technology, QR codes, Alibaba, which actually track free testing and treatment. This is very, very important. In many countries, do not have this. Mobilizing society, society and redistributing resources. They have done very well. Taiwan. It was early to ban flights from China, ex exactly as Philippines has done, using big data and repeat testing to people, free, easily accessible testing, widespread awareness program on television, universal access to healthcare at no cost. This Taiwan is a really beautiful success story. South Korea flattened the curve without any serious lockdown measures. They developed tests much before the significant cases, almost tested the entire population. And as I I have said that they Malaysia, Singapore uh, have joined the team and they have actually flattened the curve. Their death rate is so low and the number of cases are so low that uh, that these are some of the examples well, for, the, for the entire globe. Next, next please. So we do did few zero surveillance. That was my that will be my last slide. We did few zero surveillance. One zero surveillance was done in Delhi. That uh, so that slide actually got jumbled up. This zero surveillance was done in Delhi. This was found uh, that 22 percent actually were, were positive. In the other one was done in the in the Bombay in the Dharavi slums, and we found again 28 percent positive there. The other population was 16 percent population, so it averaged to 63 percent. Now ICMR carried out that results are only out few days back. I have a countrywide zero surveillance. So the uh, positivity rate were very low, 0.76 percent. The, the, there were large number of cases they concluded were mixed, missed. But again, the, uh, the herd immunity is uh, very far to develop. The surveillance data shows positivity of around 28 to 30 percent. So there are no surveillance da data. The Indian government is moving four or five major vaccines, and some of these vaccines, they suppose they will hit actually the market by the early part of 2021. We will need companion diagnostics for that, and diagnostics when the vaccination is widespread because many of these diagnostics will create a problem. So it is better that we develop a diagnostic when we will be really vaccinating our larger population. So I conclude by saying that Indian story, uh, the Asian story is something which uh, one should emulate. There has been a lot of problems, a uh, lot of hiccups. Uh, India uh, has large poor population and some, and some very rich population, huge migration which occurred. Many people died on the street. But now the test systems has got widespread 
and government of India could really ramp up the infrastructure so that except in the villages and the second and third cities, people get actually uh, admission and get treated. A lot of misconception. There are people who are very difficult to cremate people because they, the cremation ground resists that. There were, there were ostracization. There are several of these things are happening. So the community, community awareness and informing the communities truthfully will be very, very important. So thank you, Rosanna. Thank you for your um, opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ganguly and Esso. I think in the interest of time, I'll just ask you uh, one question each and then we could close the webinar. And so first question to Esso, um, what is the Philippines um, uh, testing uh, strategy to try to monitor the safety of workplaces like hospitals and care homes, uh, schools, et cetera, um, Esso? Yeah, so um, you know that's really something that's been that's been debated. It, it really depends on the pretest probability and what's going on in terms of community transmission. Um, uh, basically, there is a say uh, there's a symptom based survey at the very start, and then we can decide. Especially if we find symptomatics, then they get tested. If they're asymptomatic, then um, it really depends on the community risk. Uh, there are pooled testing strategies and there are antigen-based tests that are being looked at. Uh, but again, um, it's still evolving at this point, uh, especially since um, we don't really want to waste tests. And we know that the tests might not necessarily give us what we want because we know that there is still some false negatives, especially if you're going to try to find the timing for antigen and for, for PCR testing. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a, a $64 million question that we would all like to know um, how to monitor safe um, environments as uh, we try to ease up. Uh, Dr. Ganguly, you know, you mentioned in India there's testing on demand. Um, most of the, are most of the testing on demand, a molecular testing or antigen? Yeah, yeah actually, Rosanna, this was a tragedy. Almost all medical schools had RT-PCR machines. In Telangana coast, every two, every two kilometers there was an RT-PCR machine. They were exporting fish. But what we did, we created huge amount of regulations that you need to be uh, accredited laboratory, you need to have a PSL2 facilities, although now you don't need it with some of the molecular tests because the virus is lysed. So we, so very few, and you have to take permission, a license to test for COVID for no other infections as license were needed. So with this, actually the uh, testing became very, very limited at one time, but now since private labs have been allowed and um, many of them actually rose up to the occasion, took accreditation, and they were already doing tests for other. They had CFID, they had Biofar, they had Cobas, they had a huge number of such things. So they really came up. And some of the Indian companies have produced, uh, they have mass produced the kits, RTPCR. Like one of the persons whom you have actually nurtured, they, this is uh, Chandrasekhar, uh, the true nat. The, it was done for tuberculosis. The true nat now is in every village in India that is uh, that has been converted for COVID uh, uh, testing. So, mm -hmm. so this is how in my lab, etc. They can now export also. But what we need to do that one of the another thing which delayed this demand on testing was that. We could have uh, taken find validated tests or your validated test and others and would have done it because previously our tests had come from either, either South Korea or from China. And uh, so these were the only two things. So if they were already validated, we should not have really entered into another validation exercise. We should have allowed these to be tested to really flatten the curve. But that didn't happen in the early stages. Now, uh, the US FDA one or EMA validated things go through a very early early process of approval. So that is why we have been able to do it. We had the infrastructure. 
we had the infrastructure now the infrastructure has been pressed for this and there is a capping for the cost of the test the government of india has capped the cost of the test so you just can't charge any amount so hardly people are making profit out of the test for covid but then that's a public good and uh, i totally support that a small profit should be allowed but the test need to be capped so that the poor get the test many many uh, poor people are getting the test free of course they don't have to <laughs> pay yeah good good and and uh, i think you you brought up an important point uh, about uh, governments uh, uh, repeating the validations that have been done elsewhere uh, which is, speaks to carlos uh, idea that in the pandemic i think reliance uh, is a very important concept reliance between uh, country uh, uh, regulatory authorities as well as cooperation so that we don't uh, waste time duplicating um, uh, validations and and that's an important uh, point uh, to end this webinar because it has been our uh, problem uh, with the delay in in test rolling out testing in many countries so in closing i'd like to uh, thank all the speakers for their wonderful presentations um, there's uh, on your screen, you could see uh, a list of uh, online uh, uh, resources for COVID and it's by no means exhaustive. These are some of the main ones. I'd like to uh, point to, uh, especially to a MOOC, uh, a massive open online course on uh, COVID-19 uh, that has been uh, uh, a collaboration between FIND uh, uh, the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Me Medicine, and the Foundation Muriel, uh, in terms of having um, look at the uh, problems of uh, diagnostics uh, for uh, uh, COVID testing. And uh, the course is available in both English and, and French. And, and there you could see the, the, the web link to it. There are many WHO uh, guidances on different aspects of, uh, uh, of testing and laboratory safety. And, uh, and there's uh, uh, open uh, data uh, base for um, different diagnostic performances, et cetera. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers, thank all of you for participating and thank the wonderful staff at the Foundation Miria uh, in helping uh, all of us put this uh, um, webinar together. It's, it's been excellent and I wish we had more time for questions, but I think that we will try to um, answer. Uh, we have all the, your questions documented in the chat. We will try to uh, answer them uh, as much as possible. Uh, later. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was, it was a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amadou.